for many, many Cambodian families, uh, I don't feel that education was a top priority. I feel that it was more so, what do I eat? What do I wear? Do I have a roof over my head, right? And so uh, with that type of culture embedded into you and ingrained into you know, your living experience, you don't really have uh, as many opportunities as America sells. You know, I've even spoke to my mom about this, about like, you know, once you're raised in, you know, the east side, all you know is like drinking and partying every weekend. And some people, they stay in that kind of lifestyle, and which is why um, they don't end up like going far or doing a lot in life because that's all they know. A lot of Cambodian American families and um, are, you know, below the poverty line. Yeah. Right? And, and of course, it's directly hit by the experience of the rich. Long Beach was home to a few local gangs, namely the Tiny Rascal Gang and the Asian Boys. Even though we weren't able to reach a current or ex-gang member, we came to a conclusion, thanks to the interviewees, that gang affiliation and violence was a direct cause of the trauma of the Khmer Rouge. Associating in gang activities was either because of wanting to finally hold power as it was stripped away in the Khmer Rouge or as a system implemented to protect people's families. What's the answer? We don't want to do it, but we got to protect ourselves and stuff. I talked to one of the former gang members who say my parent was exposed to violence during the Khmer Rouge killing field and they project those violence on me and I project mine out on the street. Gangs was more in terms of a means of protection, uh, not so much status to me, but protection. Um, and that's because, again, the younger generation had to protect and serve and cater to their parents because they're older. They just gone through this traumatic experience, brought 10 kids over. Now it's like their job, their responsibility that I can speak English, I can do this, I can do that. Now, how do I protect my family? Before long, these Cambodian refugees decided to fight back. They banded together to confront a new enemy, much like they had the Khmer Rouge. They formed out of necessity. Because they were victimized, because they were uh, assaulted, because they were um, seen as perfect victims. If we start to not pass down to the next generation my music, my language, my reading, my writing, my art, my dance, my foods, if we start to not teach that, we're gonna fall. The, the new generation that's going off right now is actually um, becoming real role models and actually coming back to help in their communities, but I feel like if they wait a little longer, um, more Cambodians will come here and actually stick to their culture and actually like keep the language going. Um, and I feel like people would want to like um, see Long Beach stick to the more Cambodian side. Language, if you're not speaking it, we're gonna die. As more and more urbanized shops settle in the heart of Cambodia town, they push out the locals to benefit personal economic growth and power. Original shops and restaurants, such as Kim Long and La Loon, retrofitted their buildings to accommodate for the new modern changes to prevent other businesses from pushing the Cambodian ones out. One of the ways to counter this was by the Long Beach Art Council enacting the mural project of 2016 to help popularize the community while preserving the Cambodian traditional ideas. Cambodian children, especially first, second, you know, second generation children, going to American schools. Okay, I think that's where it comes from. They go to American schools, they learn American ideals, and they come home to parents who don't understand it. The younger generation, we're so Americanized, and um, you know, we're just trying to live our lives, kind of, you know. Um, 
go through the movements and being Khmer or you know preserving your culture, your heritage is not as relevant or important anymore, you know. We need a lot of uh, role models in uh, positions in which younger, um, the younger generation can look up to. I also think that we need a lot of activism in terms of um, fighting for uh, the Cambodian community. The community grows more institutions or even unites on creating an institute to where cultural competency is at the top primary goal, then yes, we will flourish. I think that Cambodians are actually flourishing. We continue to open our community up to others where they can come in and ex get a cultural experience. Yes, we will flourish. I think our community is going to flourish and it's because um, uh, because of this generation now, like people my age, people your age, we've, you know, our parents went through the struggles, our older siblings went through the struggles of trying to figure it out here in America, in Long Beach, and um, now that we have that experience and that knowledge, um, and we have that motivation to like keep, uh, growing, I guess. We're descendants of Angorians, you know, yeah. these intelligent, creative people who, you know, all of the technology or in ancient technology is all like amazing. So we have to keep in mind that that's where we came from. And, you know, the killing fields did set us back years and years, but still it doesn't change our DNA, right? And that's why I think we're going to thrive. Even though psychological damage has been carried within the members of the Cambodian community into the states, since the 80s and 90s, mass changes have been taking place. Education has become more and more important, gangs have reduced in numbers, and now Americanized cultures will be uprooted by the traditions being upheld by second generation youth. Even though trauma remains, and we will never forget the tragic past of the Pol Pot regime, we can only help our community thrive by moving forward, remaining resilient. We were once an empire and then we almost didn't exist. Now it is up to the second generation youth and future generations to rise to the occasion and bring our once flourished nations to its feet.